morning, everybody, and welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church, and welcome to you, those online. Uh, we are so happy that you can either join us here in person, or if you're currently on vacation, like a lot of you are, watching from wherever your beautiful, smoky destination is out there. So we are happy that we can gather in the house of the Lord and worship uh, His name together as His body. What a privilege that is. Well, if you have a bulletin, go ahead and open it. We'll just kind of quickly address some of the, the, the top things, but you can read through it for your own perusing. We are getting closer to... September, which means uh, more of our ministries will hopefully be starting back up. And with that, I just want to thank all those who have taken time to fill out our volunteer request form on our website. Uh, but we can always use more. And what a privilege it is to serve in the house of the Lord. Amen. So uh, you can serve in big ways or small ways, and they're all equally important. So please go ahead and head to our website, fbcdrumheller.com, where you'll see a little uh, cute little set of footprints in the bottom right corner that says take your next steps and you'll see a whole host of different ministries that you can choose from to serve you can even fill in there how you would like to serve and then that ministry leader will be in contact with you uh, when they find time to do so and then you will be serving here at the church so please uh, pray about where you'd like to serve and how you'd like to serve and how much you would like to serve and then go ahead and fill out that form uh, I st we're still in the summer, the last couple of weeks of summer. All the kids say, yeah, I can't wait to go back to school. And, uh, but, uh, so, so most things are still not going on. Uh, but there is Tuesday night men's prayer that meets here in the church building in the basement at 8 o'clock. Uh, there is, if needed, uh, availability to stream into that through uh, like a Zoom type service. And if you need a link for that, please contact Solo Castro, and he will be able to provide you with the necessary links. Uh, I do want to highlight with um, volunteering picking back up, a lot of ours, uh, including I found mine was as well because of the pandemic, a lot of our uh, police checks and child welfare checks have expired, and that is a requirement to serve here at Fellowship Baptist Church. We want to make sure that there's no one who can harm any of our seniors or our young uh, in our building, so please um, uh, be able uh, uh, get that information to us. It is free uh, currently to do both of those, and I believe both of them are still available to do online, so you don't even really have to go to the building if you don't want to. So uh, if you're volunteering, uh, please make sure you are getting that up to date. And if you're not aware if yours is up to date, please talk to uh, myself or Norman and we would be able to find that information for you. All right, without further ado, there are uh, a handful of different ways where you can give here at Fellowship Baptist Church by bringing up your offering uh, and ties an offering to the plate after service or through uh, via e-transfer uh, by uh, putting in the email giving at fbcdrumheller.com. There is no need for a password. We have direct deposit set up and that would be probably the most convenient way of doing it. Well, with that all in mind, would you bow your heads and pray with me before Sheila and her team comes up to lead us in our singing portion of the service. Our Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that we can gather both virtually and physically, Lord, to, uh, to raise our praises to your holy name. God, as we prayed in the back uh, today with the worship team, Lord, as the book of Psalms says, uh, we, we, uh, unless you build our, this house, Lord, that we labor in vain. So, Father, we do pray that we don't labor in vain this morning, but, Father, that, we would, uh, that you would be here building this house, that our worship would be pleasing to you. And, God, as we hear your preached word, Lord, that we wouldn't be apathetic towards the words of God, but we would hear them, Lord, and your spirit would bring about comfort or conviction in our lives, Lord Jesus. Father, we could erect all the sails that we would want to and try all the things that we want to this morning to, to please you, but unless you blow your wind into our sails, we are just laboring in vain. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just anoint our time together, Father, as we stand in the presence of you and the Holy God. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you believe this morning? Have you been set free? Are you a child of God? Let me tell you this. You are chosen. He died for you. He died for me. 
I am a child of God, and in my Father's house, there's a place for me. It's so exciting. And if that's not worth singing about, I don't know what is. So please stand, um, if you're able, and join us. refuge in the shadow of your wings and in the King James version that same verse says how excellent is thy loving kindness O God therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings let's sing about that goodness and the loving kindness of God I love you Lord your mercy never fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life been faithful. All my life you have been 
your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. time we're gonna um, have the children go downstairs for their special programming and I believe it's age five to grade five grade four grade, grade five grade four okay <laughs> if you feel like going go we had the pleasure of attending um, Jason's brother's wedding this past Sunday it's always nice to be invited and it's nice to make that cut for a wedding list, especially during a global pandemic. It's especially nice to receive that paper invitation in the mail. This next song invites the Holy Spirit to join us. Of course, the Holy Spirit is in all of us who have accepted Christ into our lives, and we know he is here with us this morning. But as Aaron teaches us about the Holy Spirit this morning, we want to extend a special invitation to the Holy Spirit and focus on his presence and appreciate the great value he brings to our lives. Nothing can compare or even can come close to his presence. So Holy Spirit, come, flood this place, fill the atmosphere. We desire to be overcome by your glory and your presence. Soften our hearts and help us to hear your words to us here this morning.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our
your presence in this building this morning and we invite you and we pray that you wash over, under, around, in, through, and among us all this morning. Help us to hear the words that you've laid on Aaron's heart. And uh, may you just soften our hearts that we might not just hear it, but be able to apply it to this week and beyond. And for those, God, that don't know you personally and may not have, that pleasure of being flooded and filled with the Holy Spirit, God, we pray that they might find you today. Um, and as Aaron prayed backstage, that their shadows of darkness would be lifted and uh, they might come to you in the light of the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you guys give a round of applause to our worship team? Amen. Amen. Well, are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? As I make some spot, or you'll see me trip off the stage, and then it will be on YouTube for the rest of eternity. And <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles, and I really hope you do, go ahead and open them up and turn them on, whatever you use, and head on over to the book of 1 John. And we're going to be starting in chapter 4. That's where we're going to camp out for a little bit today. Uh, and then we're going to be ending by looking at a couple verses in chapter 5. We're going to be continuing our series on, and we're actually ending our little mini summer series on the vital signs of life found in 1 John. And we kind of said at the beginning in our first message that just as there are vital signs of physical life, like your pulse and respiration and things like that, uh, there are also spiritual vital signs that we can look for in our lives to see if we have been reborn regenerated, born again by the Holy Spirit. And I originally wanted to put this message that I'm going to preach today first, uh, but I chose to follow the divine flow that John has laid out in his letter, and I kept it last, because that's where John has chose to keep it and put it. So throw all the messages... We have brought us back to the reality that it is not by our own work or our own efforts that save us, but it's, it, it's not by our own strength where we can produce these vital signs, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't produce these signs. If you sit there and try to force love for your neighbor or one another, or if you try to force your obedience to God and His commands, you will just be a constipated Christian. You'll be always be trying to get something to move and nothing will happen and you'll just become frustrated and you will fail time and time again. It is by the power and working and transformative work of the Holy Spirit that these signs are evident in our life, that the fruit of the Spirit are produced, not by our own doing, but by His. And let's just say, thanks be to God for that, amen? Because if it was up to us, we would just labor in vain. So this is why this last message is so important, because today we're going to be talking about the possession of the Holy Spirit and the believing heart that he gives us. This is where all of our obedience flows from, all of our love for others. This is where it all flows from, and this is where even the fruit of the Spirit comes from as well, from the possession of the Holy Spirit and the believing heart that he gives us, and it's all done through his transformative work. So with that in mind, let's read the Word of God together, and then let's pray. 1 John 4, starting in verse 13, says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we know that we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So reads the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your holy word, your word that has no error, has not been changed, but is perfect. And Lord, it is applied to every area of our life, and it produces life in us as well. So Father, I pray, Lord, as we look at your word today, God, that my words that I speak would be few and yours would be much because there's life in your words and mine are just vain. So God, speak through me today. And Lord, 
would, would we walk away more conformed to the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think it goes without saying, with the first vital sign being the possession of the Holy Spirit, but I think we should quickly address it. You cannot be saved without the Spirit of God living in you. It's impossible. There is no such thing as some persuasions teach of a second blessing that you can be saved and then have to jump through a bunch of hoops to receive the Holy Spirit. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at the conversion. The day that your faith was put in Christ, you were changed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Your desires were changed. You no longer desire evil, but now you desire God. And every believer has the Spirit because it's through the Spirit where we live and move and have our being. It's just impossible to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. We can't live the life that we're called to without the possession of Him. So don't believe those lies. You are filled today with the Holy Spirit, if you are in Christ. There are no super saints in the, in, the, in, the, in the faith, those who have the Holy Spirit, and then lesser saints, those who do not. No, we are all equal in the eyes of God, and we are all given the Holy Spirit at conversion. Because look at what John says in verse 13. He says, by this we know. By what do we know? That we abide in Him, and he in us. The word abide just means he lives in us. That we live in him and he lives in us. That we've been saved by him and we live with him for eternity. Meaning we can know we are saved. We can know we are heaven bound because God, uh, God the Spirit is living within us and we are to remain in him and he in us. And this has connections back. Maybe this sounds a little bit familiar to you, and it has connections back to the Gospel of John, where John records Jesus' exhortations to his disciples several times to remain in him. And what will Jesus do? He'll remain in them. And now John is reiterating, he's reteaching what Jesus had taught him as a young disciple and he's teaching it to us, his readers, that we, if we remain in him and he in us, we know we are saved because when we remain in him, it shows us that we have the Holy Spirit. And remember what the Holy Spirit does. He seals us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So listen to how the Apostle Paul also explains the same truth. In Romans 8.16, he says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. What a privilege. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the means of our assurance that we are truly united with Christ and that we are in the family of God. This is what John means when he speaks of our abiding in God or in Christ and He in us. If we abide in Him, we are going to reflect His character in our lives. Period. We're going to reflect the character of God in our lives. Our conduct towards others should be commensurate with God's character. So, with that in mind, how does that change how you view your daily life and routine? Knowing that God of the universe lives in you, in you in Christ, and that our character should reflect His character. How does this change how you do your daily work every day? How does this change how you speak to others? How does this change how you talk to your spouse when no one's around? How does this change how you raise your kids? How does this change at what you look at and what you do on the internet when nobody's around, knowing that God is in you and you are in God? How does this change the reality of your life? How does this transform every fiber of your being? That's a question we should all ponder and consider today and then john moves from verse 13 into verse 14 and he's moving from our assurance of our salvation that we have today in light of god giving us the holy spirit to our insurance that jesus actually truly lived and died and rose again in our place and that's important to include here in verse 14 because without christ's life without his death and without his resurrection or even if he just lived but stayed dead and never rose again, then we as believers are believing in vain. 
We actually have no assurance of salvation if this to be true because there wouldn't be any salvation at all if Christ never rose or if Christ never existed. We are, as Paul would say, still in our sins without hope and we would be most pitied among all if Christ didn't rise. So this is important why John puts this here in verse 14. When John says that we have seen and testify, he is not talking about me and you. He's not saying, hey, Aaron, you have seen. Hey, you, Ron, you've seen. Now go testify. No, what he's saying is that me, the Apostle John, had seen and the other apostles have seen with my own eyes Jesus live, do the miracles he did, say the things he said. I was there when he died and I was there when he rose. This is true. I'm an eyewitness. And not only is he an eyewitness, but all the other apostles and the 500 other plus people and all the other ones who were around when Jesus walked who are still living during the time of this writing are all eyewitnesses. This is important. John is reiterating here his apostolic authority that he walked with Christ. And that should give us assurance that Jesus lived, died, and rose again on our behalf. He is giving us insurance of that fact. And he tells us a clear mission that Jesus was on. He tells us that Jesus was on the mission to be what? To be our, yeah, to be our Savior. To be the Savior of the world. Verse 14 is a very powerful verse. And according to John Stott, a theologian, he says it's the essence of the gospel. The entire gospel In one sentence, John reveals to us the core of the gospel message that Jesus came to save sinners, to reconcile us back to the Father. Amen? And the word world there means all sinful people estranged from God under the dominion of the evil one. What John saw in the life, ministry, and death of Jesus was not a passing gaze of curiosity, but it was a steady gaze of of contemplation. And what he saw in the life and ministry of Jesus is regardless of somebody's race, regardless of somebody's face, regardless of the place they find themselves, Jesus came to save sinners. And whether they're big sinners or little sinners, whether they're rich sinners or poor sinners, or whether they're secret sinners or open sinners, it matters not. Jesus came to save just plain old sinners. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to save me. And today is the day that we must put our trust in Jesus and rest in His finished work. Jesus is the Savior of the world and no one has eternal life or assurance of salvation apart from Him. There is no other way. I believe it was Martin Luther who said, we need, I preach the Gospel all the time in my pulpit because we forget the gospel every day of our lives. So here's our reminder. We must put our trust and faith in Jesus, in his life, his death, and in his resurrection. And we see this clearly in verse 15. It says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So to confess this is not merely to state something as truth. It's easy to state something. It's easy to say that Jesus is Lord. But what the language here suggests is that it means that you are confessing, you're owning this idea as if it's truth, that it's central to your life, that everything else in your life is built upon this one thing, that Jesus is Lord. That you're saying, it's like saying a hearty amen to what God has said and done because it's true. And you're saying, so be it. And you believe it with every fiber of your being. Confession of Jesus as the Son of God means confession of Jesus' full deity. Meaning that Jesus was both truly God and truly man when He walked on this earth. And that's something that the false teachers of John's time could not confess. And you might be thinking, well, that's nice for his time. There are many in our time who confess Jesus, but he's not the Christ of the Bible. He's a fake Jesus who is there to distract, who's there to deceive, and to remove your eyes from the Christ who has come to save you. 
We must, as the body of Christ, fence this truth that Jesus is truly God and truly man. He is God. He's not some glorified human being. He's not some demigod. He is God. Right belief about who Jesus is and what He has done on the cross is essential to salvation. If you change that and you teach that Jesus wasn't God, then you are not in the orthodox Christian faith. The phrase God abides in Him and He in God is John's way of speaking about someone's genuine salvation. That they would abide in Him and He in Him. To have God abiding in you and you in God is a telltale sign that you have experienced salvation. And knowing this should change every part of how you live. God lives in you. He's not just with you here on Sunday because we're all joined together wearing our nice clothes and singing songs. No, God is with you everywhere you go. He's there when you leave here today and talk bad about someone you saw at church behind their backs. He's there. He's there when you look at things that you shouldn't be looking at. He's there when you take something that you shouldn't be taking that doesn't belong to you. He's there at your work when you make shady business deals or decisions or when you swear and cuss at the person who has cut you off. He's there in the grocery store when you have the opportunity to show love and patience or be pushy and rude. God is there. He is with you. So how does knowing God abides in you change the conduct of your everyday life? How does knowing your calling of abiding in Christ as well transform your perspective on life? How does it change that? How does it challenge that? And it's okay if it challenges that. We're not called to be perfect. We're not perfect right now. So we're always going to be pricked by these things. So how does it change? Which moves me from vital sign number three to vital sign number four, which is a heart of belief. So you can go ahead and get ready and just flip on over to chapter five because that's where we're going to go in just a moment. But the Holy Spirit brings about our heart of faith. Through the regeneration or our being born again, our hearts move from a state of unbelief to a state of belief. We begin to see things, the things of God, His gospel and His message as necessary and no longer foolishness. We used to see it as foolishness, but now we see it as necessary. We go from being enemies of God to being sons and daughters of God. We go from being foe to friend because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I said earlier, all of our vital signs, all of the fruit of the Spirit are outworkings of the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't produce them, nor do we force them, but they grow in us as we abide in God and He in us and as we rest in the finished work of Christ Jesus. Just like an apple that grows on a tree doesn't have to go anywhere else to grow. It doesn't have to go anywhere else to find its nutrients for life. It just needs to stay and remain on that tree and the tree will do the work for it. The tree will provide it with all the necessary nutrients it needs. All it has to do is receive. Be like that apple. We don't have to go anywhere else to find our nutrients, even though we're tempted to because we don't believe God satisfies us enough so we run to other means of satisfaction. Be like the apple. Just remain. So with that in mind, let's read John 5, 10 to 13, which says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. And whoever does not believe, God has made him a liar. And I just want to pause there for one second. God is not making the person a liar. That person is actually calling God a liar. Just some clarification there. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that he has given us. Eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. So verse 10 says, whosoever. And there could be two whosoevers. 
There's whosoever believes that he is the Son of God and whosoever does not believe. And depending on which whosoever you are today, the end of life will bring about dramatic differences. Different results. Not, not just mildly different, but vile, uh, 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 sorry, vitally different results. To believe this message is to abide in God and He in you. To believe this message is to possess the Holy Spirit within your life. To reject this message is to reject God Himself. To the one who does not believe God has made Him a liar. These are stark words from the Apostle John, but they fit with John's language throughout the whole letter. John is not being dramatic here, nor is he being ungracious. Rather, he's earnest. He is earnestly concerned for our souls, for the state of our souls, for his readers in his day and for his readers in this day. He is earnestly uh, working in, in worry, not worried, but working towards giving us assurance in the eternal state of our souls. Where will our souls be? In light of the clear testimony of God, substantiated by the historical ministry of Jesus and the apostolic witness and the testimony of the Spirit, John wants us to know that there is no way to be neutral on this subject. You must believe Jesus is God. God has spoken, and that's it. We either believe Him and we trust Him, or else we refuse to believe which is tantamount to, to claiming his testimony is untrue, to calling him a liar. We cannot be like the false teachers of John's time to, uh, to claim to believe God while rejecting the testimony of his son. And if you want the testimony of his son, it starts in verse 6, and you can read on from there. We're not going to do that this morning. But that is what God is saying about Jesus. And if we reject that, then we reject God. Rudolf Schneckenberg, what an awesome last name, <laughs> puts it well. He says, to reject the testimony of God is therefore a serious evil and to oppose it is a futile project. Unbelief is not a misfortune. It's not a misstep. It's not a misfortune that we should pity. It's a sin that we must deplore in our own lives. Its sinfulness of unbelief lies in the fact that it contradicts the Word of God, the one true God who does not lie, and thus what we say with our unbelief to the one true God is that we attribute falsehood to Him. When we doubt God, when we don't believe God, we are saying He's a liar. That He is not the sovereign God who can work all things out. But rather, we know better than Him. And He is not good. That's what we say to Him when we have unbelief. Now, we could go down the bunny trail of what does unbelief look in our lives, but in the context of the verses that we're reading here today, the unbelief that John is talking about is hitched to the testimony of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus was truly God, truly man. That, God, that Jesus was sent by God the Father to be the Savior of the world. Meaning the ones John is warning against confess faith in God, God the Father. They want God the Father but they don't confess faith in Jesus. But that's not possible. Because in doing so, what you do is call God a liar concerning His own Son. And no further testimony will be given to those people. They will just continue to spin their lies. You can't have the Father, beloved, without the Son. I know that maybe sounds a little uh, uh, basic to you, but it's true. You must confess Jesus to have the Father. Jesus is the only way to the Father through, through Him, the Son, period. Everything else will end in unbelief and calling God a liar. There is not multiple ways up the mountain and then we'll all end up at heaven. There's only one way up the mountain and that's through Jesus. John goes on to reinforce the importance of this testimony from God concerning His Son in verse 11, telling us it is where we find our eternal life. And this eternal life is found only in who? In Jesus. Hey, if you're ever worried about an answer, Jesus is always the right answer. So say that with confidence. It's only found in Jesus and no one else. So if you reject Jesus, you reject eternal life. That's what John is saying. 
And the word and here in verse 11 does not add a new or different idea. Rather, he's drawing out implications from a previous verse, verses 9 to 10. We didn't read 9, but it's stated that God has borne witness to the person and work of Jesus. And the witness uh, points to God's gift of eternal life in his son. So again, John's point has not been merely abstract theology. He's not trying to be fancy. He's not trying to impress us with all his knowledge and trying to confuse us about the state of Christ. Rather, what John is being is a godly pastor who is concerned for his congregation and he's contending for the life of his people, reminding them that eternal life is available only through the Son. FBC. Eternal life is only available through the Son. Don't go through other sources to find your satisfaction. It's only through the Son. Amen? This verse concludes and draws together what has been said throughout this whole section starting in 6. Since eternal life is found only in the Son, whoever has Him has life, while who does not have Him does not have life. It's that simple. To have the Son means to believe in the Son, since such faith results in abiding in Him and His abiding in the believer. And as I read this verse, my brain likes to do some fun things. I couldn't help but picture these verses here as John's closing arguments as if he was a lawyer standing before the jury. So I thought it would be fun to share with you for a moment how my brain works. It might be a scary project, but we will, we will endeavor anyways. Uh, but I want to speak for just a couple of moments as if I was the Apostle John, okay? So don't get confused here. Uh, this is just uh, as if, uh, this is how I was kind of picturing. So here it goes. As an old man, so obviously that's John speaking. Uh, Let me cut through the fog and speak with clear simplicity. Argue all you want about the gray areas, because there's none. That's why I wrote in a black and white manner. But the issue is clear cut. I was there when Jesus died for our sins on that cross. I was a personal eyewitness, as I already reminded you in the first chapter, verses 1 to 4. I was there. uh, I was the first apostle to see the empty tomb because Peter was too old and slow. I was there in the upper room a week after Jesus' resurrection when he appeared to the 12 disciples. I was there when Jesus ascended into heaven on that day. From that day until this, I have been telling others like you about this Jesus and whoever has the son has life and whoever does not have the son does not have eternal life if you don't have Jesus you don't have life but only death if you die apart from Jesus you will spend an eternity in a place called hell John continues, I I picture him continuing, taking a breath and continuing. God has given us eternal life, as I state in verse 11. Eternal life is a gift. It cannot be merited, nor can it be earned. You cannot work for it. You cannot labor for it. When somebody gives you a gift, you don't try to pay them for that gift. That would be insulting towards the gift giver. A gift, by definition, is something you don't merit, nor do you earn. That's the way of this great salvation that's found in Jesus. You couldn't pay for it anyway, even if you tried. How could we pay for such a great salvation? All the money in the world could not purchase it. Our salvation was the costliest gift ever. The price was the death of the Son of God for our sins. God himself paid this price through the death of Jesus on that cross. He did not make a down payment on our behalf and now we must make the regular monthly payments uh, or we will fall behind. No, Jesus paid the price in full. So how do you get this eternal life? You may be wondering. The same way you get any gift by receiving it. Remember what I wrote in John, my gospel, John uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To believe on Jesus is to receive this gift of salvation. I recorded that what Jesus told us, his disciples, just before his crucifixion in my gospel in chapter 14, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me the only way to get eternal life from god is through the son of uh, through the son jesus 
To have the Son is just another way of saying that you believed on the Son. And God has given you eternal life uh, to, through the Son. If you have the Son, you have that life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have that life. Faith in Jesus, who completed the work of atonement on that cross, is the only way to receive this eternal life. What is the nature of this eternal life? Well, eternal life is not just a quantity of life for how long we will live. It's also the quality of life here and now. It's not just about living forever. Eternal life is God's life in us. Okay, John stops speaking. It's back to me. Eternal life (laughs) is God's life in us right now. It's not just something we receive when we die. It's something we have now. Eternity doesn't start when we reach heaven. Eternity is now. We are living in eternity now. And we should live in light of this eternity now. The fact that what we do in the short years that we are given here on earth impacts our forever. So beloved, you must believe on Jesus to be saved. You who are watching or you who are here, you must believe on Jesus to be saved. He has taken your shame that you feel. He has taken your guilt and he has called you by name. You're in the family. You have the family name upon you and he has clothed you in righteousness. You are no longer removed from the family but now you're a part of it and guess what? You're not just a part of it because you're pitied. You're actually a part of it and you're celebrated in it. Amen. You've been given the family ring. You have the name. So to summarize what John has said in verse 11 to 12 before we close with verse 13, we see three important truths taught to us here about eternal life. First, it's not a prize that we have earned or could have earned. It was actually an undeserved gift given to us. Secondly, it's found in Christ so that in order to give us life, God both gave and gives us the Son. And thirdly, this gift of life in Christ is a present possession. A present possession. Live in light of that third one. In all of them, but in that third one, that it's a present possession. You have eternal life now. So how does that change how you're living when you live in light of eternity? Okay, let's close by reading verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Beautiful. Using another purpose statement, John summarizes his aim in writing. He writes to assure us, his readers, those who are in Christ, that if they hold fast to the name of the Son of God, that we have eternal life. We talked about in the first Sunday that we started this series that John actually uses a couple purpose statements throughout his uh, uh, book on first, or his letter in First John. But this, most commentators agree, and I agree as well, that this is the crux of the entire letter. This is where the entire letter hinges upon. Throughout this letter, John has been concerned with the eternal life. In this previous section that we have looked at, he demonstrated how possession in such a a life depends on believing the whole truth about Jesus, who Jesus is. So thus, this letter has been concerned to help this congregation that he's writing to and our congregation who sits here today to hold on to such truths, to the gospel of Christ. And when we do this, we know we have eternal life. And the emphasis on verse 13 is on our belief on their belief, on our belief. John is saying, in essence, that I am writing to you in order that you would have assurance. That is insurance to those who hold on to the orthodox faith in Jesus. And that's becoming more and more important to define in our day. Who is the orthodox Jesus? Any pastor knows the challenge of providing assurance without providing false insurance. It's so easy to provide false insurance. But John knows where true assurance lies. And he doesn't hide it from us. He tells us. John makes clear here that the assurance on offer to us today is available only through faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone, and none else. God God does not, sorry, want his children to worry, doubt, 
or lack assurance in this area, or whether they are a Christian or not, which is why John wrote the way he did, and he gave us the test throughout his letter, uh, the, the, the reason why he gave us these tests, and it's why I felt urged to preach this small series to you that you and I may know that we can have assurance in our salvation here and now and not lying on our deathbed waiting to find out if we were good enough. Because, beloved, you will never be good enough. It's not about you being good enough. It's not about how well you refrain from swearing or how much Christian music you listen to opposed to non-Christian music. It's not even about how, much, how, how well you have abstained from alcohol or playing cards or dancing, I guess, or anything like that. It's not about how many leadership positions you hold here at the church. I'm not saying those things are bad. Well, you can dance, that's okay. But I'm not saying those things are bad. Your salvation and insurance are anchored in one thing first, in Christ, in Christ alone, and his atoning work, and the life he lived, and the death he died, and the resurrection that he rose in. And from that, the Holy Spirit empowers you, and he begins to change things in you. We don't abstain from things and, and try to live holy lives out of a way to receive acceptance from God. Rather, we're accepted by God, and he changes the way we think in view and desire things. You could never live a life that would pay the price that we deserve to pay. Jesus had to, and he rose again with healing in his wings and restored us to the Father. He provided those who confess him as Lord with eternal life. Life with Jesus, not life apart from Jesus. Amen? So I want to quickly close, very quickly, by just giving you a little bit, some cautions. Cautions might be too strong of words, so maybe some encouragements, but also in the form of caution. Because after going through a book like 1 John, even though we didn't walk verse by verse through everything, you can become obsessed with testing to see if you are in Christ over and over and over again to the point where you start to question your own salvation. And that's not the goal here. If you've put your faith in Christ Jesus and those vital signs are there, then you're saved. You don't have to go around worrying about, oh, am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? Am I not saved? Oh, I must check one more time. No, if you were saved, you're saved. Okay, it doesn't ebb and flow. But what you can do and what the purpose is as well in John is that you can test to see where you are positionally in Christ. Are you living in light of the gospel to the fullest today? That doesn't affect your salvation, but it might affect a little bit of your relationship, right? So test to see if you're living in light. Because when you look at the mirror of Scripture, the perfect mirror of Scripture, what are you going to see in yourself? You're going to see faults. And you could very well take that and go, well, I'm not saved then you're missing the purpose of what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. He's trying to show you, hey, I love you, and there's something in you that's hindering your love for me. Let's remove that. Not saying you're not saved, but let's cut that out. It's going to hurt, but that's the poor purpose of the living and active word that's sharper than a two-edged sword where they can cut between bone and marrow. It removes the things that are not meant to be in our life. So reflect on the word of God and self-evaluate. Please live lives in light of the gospel, but don't go so far where you start to question your salvation because Jesus paid for it and he has reconciled you to the Father. And guess what? Nothing can pluck you from the hands of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Amen? But if you're being honest as we all need to be honest sometimes, there's probably moments in your life where you don't feel like a Christian at all. I've been there, and I, I'm sure you've been there. Moments in which you care more about what's coming on TV that night than you do about spreading the kingdom of God. Moments in which you have fallen into the same old trap and same old sin time and time again. Moments when God feels distant in your life, almost like a stranger. Seasons in which your emotions are lukewarm towards him, if not downright cold. 
when you don't jump out of bed every morning hungry for the Word of God. When your mind wanders all over the place during prayer, and that's if you can even bring yourself to pray. Does any of that sound familiar to you? You don't have to put your hand up, but that sounds familiar to me. I have seasons like that. So what do you do when that happens? Because we have an enemy whose main attack is to attack your belief about God and the validity of the promises that God has made to you. So what do you do? He's been doing this since the garden. We keep falling for it. Should you come up here after service and repeat the sinner's prayer for the 67th time in your life just to make sure? Should I fill up the baptismal tank after this and hold you down just a little bit longer to get that sin out of you? What do you do when you feel like that? Because I could very well stand up here and do you a disservice by giving you five steps on what to do. The pastor who always gives step after step is just drowning his congregation because what you do is you come into the church and you already feel like a piece of junk because you didn't pray enough that week. And now the pastor's saying, here's five more things you need to do to feel better. What are you going to do with those? You're going to fail them. You're going to feel worse. So I'm not going to give you five steps. Instead, I think what we need to do is correct our thinking on this. We need to keep believing the gospel message, no matter how we feel at any given moment, how encouraged we feel or even discouraged we feel about our spiritual progress, how hot or how cold our love is for Jesus. The answer is always the same. Exercise faith in the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself daily because as I said earlier, you will forget it daily. You will go to other cisterns for water daily. On your very best of days, you must rest all your hope on the grace that Christ has given to you. On your worst of days, that grace should be a refuge and your boast, like we see in the Psalms. Your posture should always be one of dependence on God. Many people assume the feelings of being saved indicate whether or not that they are actually saved because they don't feel like it or they feel like it. Feelings, however, are fickle, and they are dangerously misleading. And Scripture never points us to our feelings for assurance. Feelings come from assurance. We have feelings that stem from assurance, but they're not the basis for assurance. Assurance is based on one thing only, and that's the fact that Jesus and His finished work. Our feelings of being saved come from our faith in that finished work, not the other way around. Feelings are the fruit of faith, but not the source of it. So don't feel your way into your beliefs. Believe your way into your feelings, okay? We can't work for more salvation. It's impossible. We can't work to be better accepted. Oh, you're not good enough this week. You need to do a little bit more. It's impossible. All we must do is trust and rest in the fact because of Christ and his righteousness that he has clothed us in, we have been forgiven, we've been saved, we've been accepted, and we have eternal life. Amen? I want to close by reading you a a prayer from my prayer book here, uh, The Valley of Vision, which is a collection of Puritan prayers and uh, devotions. It's called The Divine Will. And what it does is summarizes these last three messages. So let's read it together, and then you will be dismissed. O Lord, I hang on Thee. I see, believe, live, When thy will, not mine, is done, I can plead nothing in myself. In regard of my worthiness and grace, in regard of my providence and promise, but only thy good pleasure. It is thy mercy, if thy mercy make me poor and vile, blessed be thou. Prayers arising from my needs are preparations for future mercies. Help me to honor thee by believing before I feel. For great is the sin if I make refuge, if I make feeling a cause of sin, a cause of faith. Show me what sins hide thee from me and eclipse thy love. Help me to humble myself for past, from, for past evils, to be resolved to walk with more care. For if I do not walk wholly before thee, how can I be assured of my salvation? If the meek and humble who are shown thy covenant know thy will, are pondered and healed, 
pardoned and healed, who by faith depend and rest upon grace, who are sanctified and quickened, whose evidence thy love. Help me to pray in faith and to find thy will by leaning hard on thy rich free mercy, by believing thou will give me what thou hast promised. Strengthen me to pray with the conviction that whatever I receive thy gift, so that I may pray until prayer be granted. Teach me to believe that all degrees of mercy arise from several degrees of prayer, and that when faith is begun, it is imperfect and must grow. As chapped ground opens wider and wider until the rain comes, so shall I wait thy will, pray for it to be done, and by thy grace become fully obedient. Amen. It's my prayer for us that we would labor and wait for the blessing of the Lord in our lives and we would go where he leads us and guides us. You're blessed. Be blessed and live in light of eternity today that we have a Savior who lived and died and rose again to provide us with assurance of our salvation. And don't keep that story to yourself. Go share it with your neighbors this week, okay? You're blessed. Amen.